Buenos días a todos. Estamos aquí en el Polilotar 2021. Hoy es sábado y tendremos una ponencia de Judy Um de Corea que hablará de la interpretación comunitaria, cómo y por qué. Bienvenida, Judy. Tú puedes empezar. Gracias. Gracias, Juliano. Uh, hola a todos. Me llamo Judy Um. Y voy a presentar en español, un poco en portugués y también en inglés, creo, porque creo que no hay intérprete de español portugués, entonces sería más fácil si hablo en inglés, creo. Y ahora voy a compartir la pantalla um, de mi presentación. Um, ¿Puedes ver la pantalla? Sí. Vale, sí. Um, voy a empezar. Uh, muy buenos días a todos. Me llamo Jiri y hoy voy a presentar sobre la interpretación comunitaria, cómo y por qué. Y, uh, muchas gracias por la invitación en esta conferencia de Poliglotar. Como soy de... Corea, uh, participar en una conferencia de Brasil es una experiencia muy especial y única. Entonces vamos a empezar. Um, los contenidos que voy a explicar un poco es primero sobre mí y voy a uh, presentar la diferencia entre la traducción e interpretación. Creo que la mayoría de la gente Um, conoce la diferencia, pero para explicar un poco más. Y uh, voy a dar unas explicaciones y um, definiciones de interpretación comunitaria. Y también en esta presentación me voy a enfocar un poco más sobre la interpretación judicial, porque es una cosa que tengo más experiencia y trabajaba como intérprete en los tribunales. También voy a presentar los, las cualidades que los intérpretes deben tener y también los modos de interpretación como consecutiva, simultánea y también um, traducción a vista y los papeles que los intérpretes tienen y para las personas que quieren ser intérpretes, ¿cómo pueden ser intérpretes judiciales? Entonces, todas las uh, letras de mi presentación en este PowerPoint están en portugués, pero voy a hablar en inglés o uh, español. Es que puedo hablar portugués, pero... Um, es más fácil para explicar las cosas en español porque uh, las cosas de esta presentación son un poco complicadas. Ok. Primero, uh, voy a presentar sobre mí. Uh, yo soy políglota internacional de Corea del Sur y yo digo que soy internacional porque... He vivido en uh, varios lugares, por ejemplo, nací en Seúl y luego en Vancouver y también uh, viví en Ginebra, Ginebra, en Suiza, como uh, estudiante de intercambio. ¿Y uh, qué hago uh, por la vida? Mi trabajo es, yo digo, especialista de lenguas y yo sé que es un término muy general, pero prefiero este término porque hago todas las cosas relacionadas con los idiomas. Por ejemplo, hago traducción, interpretación y también enseñanza de los idiomas. Entonces, en lugar de decirme como soy traductora o intérprete, prefiero ese término, especialista en los idiomas. Y... Um, en mi trabajo de traducción, lo que hago principalmente es la interpretación comunitaria y uh, especialmente uh, me interesan mucho los trabajos humanitarios. Entonces, um, sería judicial y también um, 
interpretación judicial significa que trabajo en los tribunales. Um, sí, son las informaciones sobre mí. Y después, um, un poco de detalle sobre la presentación ahora es que yo quería compartirles algunas informaciones sobre la interpretación, pero está um, um, concentrado o um, sería bien si estáis inter interesados en los asuntos humanitarios, porque uh, los idiomas y los asuntos humanitarios son los um, dos puntos o las dos cosas que me interesan particularmente um, en esa sociedad y en la comunidad. Entonces yo siempre pensaba, como hablo seis o siete idiomas, cómo puede, podría usar mis idiomas para ayudar al mundo. Y esa pregunta yo tenía por uh, uh, toda mi vida y yo pensé que con los idiomas y también mi educación y entrenamiento en traducción sería mejor si trabajo como intérprete de um, humanitaria. Entonces era esta pregunta era como una de las motivaciones que yo tenía. Entonces para la gente que no tiene mucho conocimiento sobre las diferencias entre traducción e interpretación. Um, la traducción trabaja con la escrita. Está dicho en um, este PowerPoint. Um, uh, entonces, traducción es traducir las palabras de papel y um, sí, cambiarlo en un otro idioma. Y también interpretación es uh, entre los um, es la traducción oral. Simplemente, sencillamente sería la diferencia principal. Entonces, como um, dice este PowerPoint, traducción hay dos. Interpretación que es oral o señalizada y traducción es escrita. Entonces, yo um, como intérprete prefiero la interpretación porque creo que es más divertido y también hay um, las interacciones directas con los ponentes y los oponentes. Mientras que la traducción, yo creo que um, es un trabajo muy interesante la traducción, sí, pero um, estoy, me siento un poco, me aburro un poco cuando yo estoy sola en la casa, en mi cuarto, traduciendo todo el tiempo. Entonces prefiero la interpretación. Sí, es mi um, opinión personal, muy personal. Y um, te voy a, les voy a enseñar un poco sobre los modos de interpretaciones. Entonces, uh, types and modes. Types, los tipos. Hay simultáneo, consecutiva, whisper, no sé cómo se, cómo se dice en español, relay, liaison. Eh, Whis, whispered en portugués, susurrada. Ah, susurrada. Ah, sí. Eh, los modos, hay conferencias, judicial, escorte, uh, sector público, me, médico, fine language los idiomas señal y la media. Y um, la interpretación judicial que voy a explicar es um, una mezcla de todos los tipos que está mencionado aquí, como usa los simultáneo, consecutiva y también um, traducción a vista. Les voy a explicar un poco más después en esta presentación, pero sí. Uh, la conferencia, conferencia um, principalmente usa el tipo de simultáneo y es fácil si puedes imaginar como una conferencia internacional o como la conferencia de ONU o de las grandes empresas y los ponentes hablan y hay un intérprete que uh, hacen la interpretación al mismo tiempo que 
ahora no tenemos en esa... Sí, no veo ningún intérprete aquí. Y sí, simultáneo es muy difícil uh, desde mi punto de vista, pero también todos los tipos de interpretación son muy difíciles por varias razones. Porque simultáneo es difícil porque tienes que escuchar y hablar al mismo tiempo y es fácil um, olvidarse de lo que has oído. Y también uh, consecutiva puede ser muy difícil y muy complicado porque tienes que tomar notas y a la hora de leer las notas otra vez es a la vez es un poco difícil um, leer y entender lo que has puesto o lo que has escrito. Y también no está en esta uh, imagen, pero la traducción a vista es que cuando leas uh, los textos y traducir al mismo tiempo, es un poco como simultáneo y... Uh, la mayoría de los intérpretes practican con traducción a vista cuando uh, aprenden los modos simultáneos, pero sí. Y los modos conferencia judicial, medical y um, la traducción judicial y medical están consideradas como uh, interpretación humanitaria. Ahora, la interpretación Yes. Tenemos preguntas sobre qué es Relay el Liaison. Oh, ok. Relay and Liaison. Oh. Relay um, is Liaison primero. Liaison would be. Um, so, escort, it's almost like escort. <laughs> Te voy a responder in English. It's almost like escort. So you go, you follow that person, and then um, you translate. So I would say it's one of the types of escort and relay. I'm actually not sure what relay is. I guess many interpreters like change their roles. So one person does the interpreting, and the other person does it right after. Um, I don't know what the reason is, but I think that happens, yeah. I think relay is when uh, one interpreter must interpret from the other because they don't understand the first language and then they have to interpret the interpretation, right? Oh, yeah. Tienes sentido. So I'm going to switch to English because I feel more comfortable with English. Okay, okay so... That was the um, interpretation methods and types. And then now moving on to community interpreting, this is what I wanted to get to. And this is like the, yeah, main point that I wanted to address. So it says, I've put down the, inter um, the definition in Portuguese. So there's community interpreters who are, for example, they work, um, in between patients that would be for um, medical interpreting that are not fluent in the official language of the country. And um, yeah, so basically a patient or a person at the court um, communicating with other uh, members. So it would be in between doctor and patient and then in the court. So these, I believe that this community interpreting is at the intersection of human rights and social assistance. And this is a uh, very popular type of interpreting these days, especially because uh, the world is um, becoming one. It's almost like a village and there's many immigrants coming into the country and many refugees also being accepted into different countries. So community interpreting in South Korea is a very new concept because we've always had simultaneous and consecutive interpreting for like the higher ups, right? For the government officials and big companies. We've always had that, but this community interpreting is 
something that is very foreign and new to Korea, Korean society, because Korean society has always been very homogeneous, homogeneous meaning that um, we have always prided ourselves on being homogeneous, not having a lot of foreigners in our country. So that was like way back in the past, but recently we've been seeing a, an increasing number of immigrants coming into Korea. So an influx of immigrants, that basically means that there is a higher need and demand for interpreters um, because that's the way the society functions. Unless all the immigrants are masters of the Korean language, we would need um, interpreters at some point. So community interpreting is not well established in my country. I'm going to explain further, but it, oops, it is not well established, but the Korean government is trying to uh, yeah, build the foundation of this interpreting system. So next is the judicial interpreting that I've always wanted to explain, and this is uh, the main point. So it is an interpretation done between a judge and um, the person in the tribunal. So my experience with judicial interpreting is um, I used to work at the administrative court in Seoul and I interpreted between French and Korean. So there would be a Korean judge and then a client who is from Sub-Saharan Africa. This is because I worked with an NGO that um, helped out Sub-Saharan African French speaking refugees. So they would come to Korea without any knowledge of the Korean language. And they were so desperate to be accepted as Korean, um, as refugees in Korea. So I was there translating between Korean and French. So the judge would say something in Korean and then I would have to translate that um, Simultane either simultaneously or whispering, and then the refugee uh, would um, listen, hear my interpretation, and then that person would reply back in French, which I also have to interpret. So it's a very um, complicated process, and I felt a lot of pressure interpreting in between the uh, judge and the client because it's something that um, they are so desperate. So they've um, had to get out of Korea and like leave Korea if they were not admitted into this country. So this is another point that I wanted to make. So there's other types of interpreting like simultaneous, like um, for government and political purposes and business purposes. Those are also very, very important because you're helping these companies um, sign a great uh, fancy deal and also you're helping your government. Uh, I don't know, like sign these diplomatic agreements with other countries. That's also important. But human lives um, at stake are also can be helped with these kinds of interpreting. So I thought that was a um, very important task that the interpreters had. And then um, los refugiados. Os refugiados. So refugees. Um, I thought I would need to explain a little bit um, about refugees in order for you guys to understand um, better the process of interpreting, community interpreting. So refugees are people who are forced out of their country because they're persecuted uh, by their race, religion, nationality, and uh, pertenecimiento a un grupo. So pertaining to a special group, social group, or political opinion. So these people usually flee, escape the violence and uh, armed conflicts. So um, the persecution has to be one of the five reasons, race, religion, nationality, affiliation to a specific group, social group, or political opinion. So. This is one of the things that I had to really focus on while interpreting because these people had to prove that they were persecuted because of one of the five reasons. And it's really hard for them, hard for the refugees to prove that they were persecuted for the following reasons because 
these refugees were just kicked out of the countries, like persecuted, and they didn't have any time to prepare or collect documents that are related to these reasons. So at the court, what usually ends up happening is the judge asks the refugee the reasons for which they are applying for refugee status in Korea, and then they would have to prove, for example, somebody is, I don't know, like, um, somebody was persecuted because that person was lesbian, for example. And that person had to prove um, at the court how they persecuted and what are the evidence of persecution. So everything had to be uh, submitted as evidence, which refugees were not able to provide because they were forced out of their countries with no notice. So those were the difficulties and so the competence or qualities of an interpreter. Interpreters have a very big role in um, these humanitarian concerns and also, as I mentioned, like business and political um, atmosphere. So interpreters have to be these um, magical multitasking people who have to do everything at the same time. So obviously the linguistic competence is very important. It's the foremost um, important trait. So while I was interpreting between French and Korean, I had to read this really thick book that had all the legal jargons um, that was translated into French and Korean. And while I was learning the terminologies, I also had to read legal books. Um, I had to look into legal literature to understand what the concepts meant because at that time I didn't have any prior knowledge of the legal system or whatever. And um, things that were written in Korean, I couldn't understand even as a native speaker. So I had to look them all up. So linguistic competence that um, ties closely into vocabulary and background knowledge. So vocabulary that includes um, um, los idiomas judiciales and um, languages that are specific. And also, because I was interpreting between Sub Saharan African refugees and Korean, it was really hard for me to understand their dialect. So they were com coming from all these different countries from Sub Saharan Africa. And the French I speak is Parisian France, of French. So I also had to um, study what type of French they were speaking and those um, African French is like really diverse they have all these different dialects and tribe tribal like um, vocabulary and stuff so I had to study that and as I said background knowledge is very important and I guess another important quality of an interpreter is um, to be really agile and to respond to questions quickly. And there are uh, times when I don't know, for example, a certain word or expression, but I would have to continue, carry on the conversation. Because if I um, am terrified because of making a mistake, everything is gonna be caotico, right? A chaos, so yeah. I had to force myself to be good at things. And okay, now the modes of interpreting. As I said, community interpreting, especially the judicial interpreting is really special in that it uses three types of modes. So the first one is simultaneous interpreting. So as you can see in the photo here, simultaneous interpreters, they listen to what the uh, locutora dice and then they have to translate it on the spot. So this one is, um, I've studied interpreting and I've um, been trained and this is, I guess, one of the hardest and most um, energy consuming type of interpreting, but these um, things happen at the court. So interpreting messages um, at the same time. And um, this is the most common uh, method of interpreting because, uh, it involves uh, the judges, what the judges say, and also lawyers and yeah, what the judge, the instructions of the judges. So many interpreters practice this uh, simultaneous interpreting 
con más frecuencia, con más frecuencia, so with more frequency, and then other uh, types of interpreting. Because if you don't practice simultaneous interpreting, it gets really rusty and it's kind of impossible to perform at your best. So I have to constantly practice this. And then the second one is consecutive interpreting. So consecutive interpreting is carried out in this type of situation. So when the defendant says something, I would have to take notes and then uh, depending on my note, um, like relying on my notes, I would have to recreate what the person said. So the interpreter listens to um, the original language and then changes it into the target language and 40 to 60 words per um, for this. But I would say minute wise, it would be like four, three, three to four minutes the defendant says something, I would take notes and then I would have to recreate that. And um, this is especially used in settings such as interviews between the client and the attorney. Uh, the lawyer and many people many interpreters say that this is the most difficult type of interpreting because simultaneous is of course in, um, very challenging and difficult but simultaneous you don't need a huge memory retention because you're translating at the same time so it's hard to forget what you just heard but um, consecutive is the person talks for five four to five minutes and then you take notes and then you have to recreate that uh, relying on your memory. So even if you have notes, it's very hard to um, get into all the details. So this is also one of the um, difficulties I had when I was um, practicing interpreting because it's hard to decipher your own notes. So you have to have a very good note taking strategy and uh, very good memory. And then the last type of interpreting is traducción a vista. So this one is kind of inter interesting and I guess you use it at the court most frequently because you read a written document and then at the same time as you're reading, as your eyes are on the paper, your mouth has to uh, speak the language in another language and then turn it into another language. So in the tribunal settings, this traducción uh, vista is uh, very frequently used and um, yeah, very frequently used for written documents and um, such as like police reports and the judge reports. And occasionally these documents are formal or informal in um, the lengua extranjera and then um, even if interpreters have the opportunity to read the documents on um, in advance, it is necessary, it is crucial that the interpreter knows how to anticipate the content of the text so that the visual translation becomes faster. So the capacity that an interpreter must have here is to read rapidly read fast and anticipate the content that the text is going to have. So, um, los papeles de los intérpretes. ¿Por qué son importantes los intérpretes? So, in, as I've mentioned, in these settings, interpreters are probably the most important. When, when there's no interpreters, nothing can happen. Right? There's two people sitting, one's Korean, one's from, I don't know, Senegal. They don't know how to communicate. So I felt very proud of myself um, making things happen um, just because of my linguistic and um, translation skills. So um, they have a very big responsibility serving as the bridge of communication and interpreters also need to translate um, the message, but also, um, yeah, linguistic component is very important because you need to convey the message, but also cultural understanding is very important because um, as you know, words have different meanings and depending on the context, um, things can be interpreted differently. 
So if you're now interested in becoming a judicial interpreter, how can you become one? So I actually don't know. I have no idea about Brazil, right? So I'm from South Korea, so I have no idea about Brazil. But in Korea, what happens is, as I mentioned before, this um, system is not well established because we've just been recently accepting migrants and refugees. But in Korea, there are um, depending on the court, there is a type, some sort of exam, and then you can have like certificates or formation. But um, when I was working at the court, I didn't have any education or training regarding this. I just had my languages and I had to take like an um, intensive course that is offered by the court, but it wasn't anything official. So. I think um, I think in Brazil there is also demand for this kind of interpreting as well. And if you're interested in working in this kind of field, I strongly recommend you to look into it because it's a very um, rapidly growing industry, and I'm pretty sure you can oh, make a very meaningful career out of it. So. Um, just a wrap up of the judicial interpreting is it is a trabajo en demanda, so it is in demand for immigrants and refugees. It's very gratifying. I was very happy with the work that I was doing because I felt like I was contributing to the world. And um, if your wish is to, as I said, uh, to make this world a better place and you're good at languages. You like languages? I can't think of a better job than this. So you can um, help contribute to the world. Um, that was it for my presentation. And do you have any questions? Yeah, we have some questions here already. Uh, let me read yeah. the first one from Francesco. With simultaneous, you just go with the train of thoughts of the person talking, right? Consecutive can get tricky as the emphasis used by the person could get lost in the process. Do you think yeah. this applies? Maybe I'm wrong. I think you made a really good point because simultaneous, you just translate on the spot and then, yeah, at the same time. So you have less chance of forgetting or interpreting it in a different light. But consecutive, it is tricky because you take notes and then you try to recreate it after um, in your own language. And depending on what you think is important, right? You can emphasize something and you can put a less emphasis on some other things. So that might be uh, not the that might not be the intention of the speaker. So it really depends on how you decipher your notes and how you understand the speaker. So Rafaela is mentioning that we can put some notes uh, in the note taking to highlight what's more important or emphasis. Yeah, yeah, that's a good um, point. So I think so the production part of interpreter is very important because you need to be able to produce it in another language. But I think prior to production, what's more important is comprehension. So you listen to the speaker and then you need to comprehend what the speaker is emphasizing. So if you think, oh, I learned this in inter interpreting, if the person says things like extremely or those L-Y words with a strong emphasis, you put like a circle or a star behind it next to it so you can emphasize it when you're interpreting so yeah it is um important to understand all the nuances and yeah i have a question uh about community interpreting because who pays for that of course it's not the refugees it's not people in need so is it the government yeah 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 it is it is the government and um at least in Korea, it works like that. The court pays, and obviously the government pays to the court, and that comes to my pocket. But yeah, it's obviously not the refugees. And sometimes um, with the NGOs, I had to volunteer with the NGOs, but the court is yeah funded by the government. So oh, do we have more questions? You can use the microphone, people. Podem perguntar em português também, pessoal. E aqui, se tiver, não sei, tem alguma pergunta? E aí, quem mais? Who else? 
Let's see in the chat box. Judy, I think you can stop sharing your screen already. Okay, okay. Oh, well, I have a question for you, Juliano. So does yes. this um, court interpreting exist in uh, Brazil? Um, I have never interpreted in a court in Brazil, but uh, maybe Raquel can, can explain better. Raquel, please come here. <laughs> Raquel is also an interpreter. Oh. Yes, Judy. So in here, most of the times, um, the court interpreting happens only for the official translators um, of the government, the official interpreters and um, translators. There are times that uh, random interpreters are called. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's not common. Oh, so do you need to write a test for the government? Yes, there is something uh, called, uh, called sworn interpretation uh, translation, and those people they are responsible for this type of uh, interpretation as well. So they are hired from from the government itself. They they are asked to go to the court and, and to do this type of interpretation. I think that a sworn uh, translator can answer it better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, do you have more work as community interpreter or private interpreter for agencies, for example? Oh, actually, de este momento, ahora, ahora mismo, no tengo mucho trabajo como intérprete. <laughs> Muy triste, pero sí. <laughs> well, um, I I started focusing more on translation, but um, I guess there's different seasons, right? So some seasons I would um, be very busy working on private uh, companies, and sometimes I would uh, go to the court. But that um, the court interpreting happened um, several years ago, so not really now. And what do you think about the pandemic and remote interpreting? Did it change, oh. change for you? Yeah, it changed um, a lot for me, but I prefer remote interpreting. Well, I miss the human interaction, right? So when you go interpreting, you get to meet so many people, but I also like the fact that I can save time to my commute and I um, interpret um, on Zoom and stuff and I find it very convenient. And we have a question from Vittoria. Where are the refugees in Korea from? Oh, so there was a huge um, influx of African refugees. As I mentioned, there was the Sub-Saharan refugees. And then also from Southeastern Asia, like Vietnam or Thailand. And the biggest source of refugees, North Korea. So North Korean refugees, yeah, they are... Well, we don't need interpreters for North Korean people because we speak the same language, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Francesco wants to know what was the most challenging situation you had to deal with? Oh, challenging situation, I would say, not coming up with the right word. So I think it was a very um, simple, simple vocab, like mango or something. And then I, I just didn't know how to say mango, which is mong in uh, French. So I had to like throw like a random word, but just pretending that I understood, right? So. But pretending is very important. So interpreters have to be like actresses. You just need to act. But uh, as you said, those situations sometimes involve refugees or people in, in difficult situations. Did you have to deal with any emotional difficult situation? Oh, or yeah, people yeah. People crying, oh. things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, people cry. <laughs> I mean, that happens a lot at the courts and people like scream, some people scream and I really wanted them, I really didn't think um, they should be too emotional, but like if you go to like the hospital, they sometimes go through surgery and then they're like, I don't want any surgery and they're screaming. And um, those emotional situations, I went there as an interpreter, but I had to be a mediator and almost like a psychologist. So that was like a problem. Yeah. Great. And Gabriel 
doesn't know if you said that already, but what languages do you speak? And what languages do you work with also? Okay, okay. I speak Korean, English, French, Spanish. Também eu falo português, mas não muito bem. <laughs> I really forgot a lot of my <laughs> Portuguese, but I have B2, guys. I have B2 a Portuguese, so it's intermediate. Okay? And then Italian and Mandarin, like, mais ou menos. But my working languages are um, um, Korean, English, mainly Korean and English, and sometimes French. Oh, I thought you spoke better Spanish than French, so that's not the case. No, I speak French better. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if people want to ask a question in French, no problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not a problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, so David is saying that the right to an interpreter is recognized by the American Convention on Human Rights to which Brazil is a party state. So yes, it's guaranteed. Okay. Okay. But That's no. great. I don't know if we have more questions. We still have some minutes if people wanted to ask something. Alguma curiosidade, pessoal, sobre a vida dos intérpretes? E, Judy, talvez em português, maybe in Portuguese, é, os, uh, o governo e as agências pagam é, preços similares ou é muito diferente? Is it different um, the price is paid by government and agencies? Yeah. Um, la, las, as agencias pagam muito mais. E, um, eu acho que o governo, governo, disse governo, governo, uh, governo uh, não paga, paga como mínimo, então <risos> é como uh, mais ou menos como atividade voluntariado, <risos> mas eu faço porque é muito gratificante. Sim. João, quer fazer uma pergunta? Você abriu o microfone aí? Não sei. Ah, legal. Então você combina é, o voluntariado com a vida profissional, né? Sim. Alô, João? Ah. Você quer fazer uma pergunta ou não? Não, agora não. Ah, tá ok. Tá ok. Então, Juri, você é, é intérprete há quanto tempo já? Juri, can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah. For how long have you been an interpreter? Um, so, throughout um, university, I interpreted while I was studying. So I guess those were kind of unofficial interpreting. And after I graduated and after I went to interpreting school, I interpreted as a professional. So I would say about six years. Six years, okay. okay. And do you think it's important to be part of associations? And what does it well, bring to you? Yeah, because I paid three three hundred dollars for the American Association, right? <laughs> I paid three hundred dollars. Can you believe that's so expensive? But I paid because it's. I guess it's. Me da ventajas. It's como ventajas como it gives. I guess more credibility. It really depends on your skills. If you interpret well, people are going to recognize you and. Uh, but I think it's important to have some kind of credentials, so, yeah. Okay, so we still have time for one last question by Francesco. What do you feel like is going to be the future of interpretation and translation? Oh, I think the future is going to be kind of different, um, especially for translation, because I think it's going to be more like machine-aided translation. So you would first, the machine would translate it and people would be, 
uh, like a proofreader. So proofreaders, editing. But I still think that um, humans are in need for this field and machines cannot uh, replace all. And especially for interpreting, uh, there's a lot of cultural context involved. So if you hire a machine to do all of that, your company is probably going to get bankrupt. So, yeah. OK, thank you very much, Judy. It was great to hear you and you gave very good information for everyone who wants to become a translator or interpreter. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, in, in a little over 20 minutes, we have the next talk in another link, people. OK, we have two talks starting next. OK, see okay. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Obrigada. Bye. Bye.